Hey everyone, welcome to Kelly's Art Throb. I'm Kelly, and today I'm sharing a neurographic style doodle that I worked on this week for about a day and a half. So there's a lot of detail and embellishment and cool textures to run our mental fingers through. I usually start my neurographic drawings with some meandering random lines, and then I add some organic shapes. And then of course, I follow that up by rounding all the corners. It's very spontaneous, unplanned, intuitive, maybe a little rambly. And that's why I love to do it, especially when I'm kind of gnawing on some ideas or, you know, just thinking about things that are happening and going on. So if that sounds good to you, we're going to go ahead and get started. The first part of a neurographic style drawing, which I like to think of as the skeleton or the scaffolding, that's the easy part. The rest of it requires a little bit of inspiration because I like to doodle inside what's between all the lines and going to sometimes a flea market or um, maybe the city market or any place that just has a lot of random colorful vibrant things is it's just like a smorgasbord of visual textures and inspiration um, especially when they have things like jewelry and wrought iron and a lot of frames and things like that. Stuff with repeating motifs. Those are especially rich. <laughs> but not only did I get to an antique mall, I also got outside. Um, I was looking for burr oak acorns. And the burr oak acorns, the hat on it has these curly fibers. They really do look like some sort of cool fabric, but wiry. Unfortunately, I don't think they're quite ready to drop their acorns yet. So um, it might be another week or so before they're ready, but that's okay. I, I still got out. I went to the park yesterday morning. I left about six o'clock and I got there about 20 past six and the weather was just beautiful. It was like 57 degrees and it was humid and the humidity was warm, but the air was cool. <laughs> so there was just a little bit of fog and um, it was warm enough that you could, you, you didn't have to have a jacket or warm clothing and it was cool enough you could move around and not feel hot and sweaty and you know it, it's just like a, the perfect temperature to go out and just be outside i guess i didn't realize how short the days are getting already and but they really are I got to the park about 20 past six and there were already cars there i think there were I counted four cars and one pickup and it was still dark. It was pitch dark and I wanted to get out and wander around in the dark, but I didn't really feel safe. So I didn't do it. I chickened out better safe than sorry. I think, um, <laughs> especially cause I have kind of a bum knee right now, but I'll get to that later. But, um, I just stayed in the car and I drove around my little town and, you know, there's something kind of exciting about being outside when it's dark and watching it gradually get lighter over uh, 15 minutes or so. And so that's what I did. And I don't get to do that very often. So I, I just soaked it in. It seems like I don't really have a lot of opportunity for true solitude. I mean, I do work alone in my studio, but there's always the potential and it definitely happens frequently 
of being interrupted and not really having a true two hours or even an hour of not being interrupted. It almost never happens at home. Um, you know, my husband works at home. One of my adult kids works at home. And then the other one uh, works second shift. So, and the cat. <laughs> There's always activity in the house. So even just being able to drive around and like I said, be present in the experience of watching it go from pitch dark to bright and not sunny. Uh, I didn't get to see the sun rise, but just seeing it get light and it's transformative and it's very inspiring and uplifting, I think. Um, and I was gone for four hours. I, and I was by myself the entire time, except when I was walking around the park, I did uh, stop and chat with a woman who, well, actually she stopped and chatted with me. <laughs> I was taking some pictures of textures like tree bark and leaves and stuff. And she came up and asked me what I was doing. And um, I kind of explained, I didn't go into great detail, but um, then she started telling me about all the wildlife that she sees there. Apparently she goes there a lot. And so it was, it was nice just to connect with somebody else in the community, even though it was brief and it, it was just nice. And it occurred to me that I, I just don't do that very often and I need to do it more. And with the weather getting cooler, those opportunities are going to present themselves more and more. So I need to um, make sure I plan things in a way that I can get away without feeling too guilty. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about this part of the drawing that to me, it looks a little bit like, well, elegant guts. <laughs> And it seems like whenever I first started doing neurographic style art, I was focusing on that whole gut brain connection and trying to find ways to support my gut health. I started going to a new dermatologist for a skin condition that I have. And she put me on this medication that is supposed to help your help your gut a little bit and also change the way your body metabolizes sugar. And even though I'm not a diabetic and um, my blood work says I'm not even pre-diabetic, I'm disputing that a little bit because this medication is working pretty well. The, <laughs> the first five days I was on it, I was taking it at the wrong time of day and um, it interfered with my ability to uh, keep anything in, let's just say. And the problem was that it coincided with my second week of physical therapy. And I have a torn, we think, a torn meniscus in my left knee. And they can't really do anything about it except strengthen the muscles that support the knee. So I'm going to physical therapy, but um, the day before my second physical therapy appointment, I started taking this medication and I didn't know it was gonna to do to me what it did. So um, my appointment was first thing in the morning and at like four o'clock in the morning, I had not slept a wink. So I texted and said, hey, I'm sick. I'm not gonna be able to make it. And they were really nice and understanding um, because I've gone to physical therapy there before and, uh, then the rest of the weekend, um, I'm taking this stuff and I think I've got it figured out. I think I just have to be careful about eating anything with too much fat in it or salt or sugar. So basically I wasn't eating much of anything, <laughs> um, cause I was afraid of, you know, n not being able to do anything. So the next, I think it was like, 
a Monday that I had physical therapy again and it was in the afternoon and I thought I was doing okay with this medication but um, my appointment was at 4 and I thought at, at about 2.45 I better eat something to fuel up because they do work you pretty hard and um, yeah about 45 minutes later I realized I was not going to make the next physical therapy appointment so and I didn't even call or text because I was in the middle of a deluge <laughs> and I didn't want to call while I was in the bathroom obviously and I didn't even want to text because I have kind of a problem with my phone where I'm texting and <laughs> I always overthink my text messages and like, did I say that right? Did, should I explain more? And then I'll fat finger it and I'll send it, you know, when it's not ready. <laughs> and I did not want to do that. Ugh. I don't like being in that kind of a situation. And I'll tell you something else. When you don't eat, not only does it make you rethink that kind of interaction, you know, and wanting to make sure you don't, I don't know, it just made me really insecure about every social interaction I had, every single one, every text message I sent, every phone call, um, you know, I went to an event where I didn't know very many people and I came home that night and I was very, in, just feeling insecure about how, um, how I acted or you know, was I cool enough or not really cool enough? I don't know exactly, but, and I'm not usually like that. I mean, I thrive in situations where you throw me into a group of people I don't know. I can totally socialize. It, maybe it goes back to that thing where, you know, like if you are mad at everybody, it means that you need to eat something. And if you feel like everyone is mad at you, you need to sleep, or maybe it's backwards. I don't know, but either way, um, I was very insecure about all of my social interactions that whole week. And so I wonder how much of depression and stuff, anxiety is caused by possibly metabolic issues. I know it starts in the gut. I know it does. and. Um, have I, have I solved that problem? No, I haven't. I'm working on it. I think not being physically active also makes it feeling isolated and, and feeling like your body won't do what you want it to do. I think that definitely has an impact on social anxiety as well. And so, yeah, I'm nipping this whole knee thing in the bud or I'm trying to. And I got to tell you that when I went back the next time, I had kind of an icy reception. The receptionist was pretty cool. And um, I just apologized profusely. And But I know how it is because I used to book appointments. And there's, there's this one kind of person, and we probably all know them. They think schedules are for everybody but them. And... Um, they frequent, we, we had people who would frequently cancel at the last minute or just not show. And it's just, you know, it's a, it's a specific kind of person. And I know she was looking at me like I was that person, or maybe that I didn't really want to do physical therapy, but it was my idea. So I definitely want to do it. Um, and the physical therapist, they gave me a different physical therapist. So maybe the physical therapist I was working with thought that I didn't want to work with them. I hope not. God, I hope not. But um, <laughs> the person that worked with me that day, oh my gosh, I was so sore for the next three days. And then the fourth day I went to another physical therapy appointment and I told them, I said, I am really still sore. But um, it kind of makes me wonder if I was, do you think they were punishing me a little bit? Maybe. I mean, I, they didn't hurt me. I don't think they would ever do anything like that. But there might have been just a little bit of, eh, we'll tweak her 
routine just a little bit. I don't know. <laughs> I Probably not. I doubt it. But I kind of think so. <laughs> I know when we had people who did that, I worked at a I worked at a cosmetology school and some of these ladies were very entitled and um, they wanted to be with the same student every time and they would totally trash our schedule and then they would come in and demand and I mean we didn't have very many people like that but we had a few and boy oh my goodness so that's the saga of my <laughs> my knee and my physical therapy and my um, my gut health. <laughs> I'm aware that I'm rambling. That's just the way they, this kind of drawing, it lends itself this, to this kind of narrative. And um, what I really was wanting to talk about was getting into flow and why it was so good to get out and be by myself for a while and have some solitude because that's that was really the whole point of I don't know how I ended up on all the other stuff but basically that's what I want to talk about one of the great things about doing neurographic style art is that you really can get into a flow state if you really if you really get into it and really start to just escape into the groove of what you're doing and then, of course, it's also really great for processing feelings and um, events, things that have happened, even your own attitudes. I also like to listen to audiobooks about being creative, how to be, how to induce a flow state. And recently, I was listening to an audiobook called "Conversations with Paul Simon," and. It's best as an audiobook rather than reading it because it literally is conversations with Paul Simon. And there's also instances when they're talking about the music and he picks up a guitar and basically demonstrates what he's talking about. And I was not like a huge Paul Simon fan, but I am now. Um, I mean, I had growing up I had some Simon and Garfunkel albums and I don't know back in the 90s I bought Graceland I think it was the 90s and just listening to him talk about and and, and the person who was interviewing him talk about how he created music and things like um, when he did Graceland, he went to Africa and it was during apartheid and none of the musicians and artists were supposed to go over to Africa because that would, that would be, um, I don't know, making it seem like they, they had support for the government over there, but he went anyway. And it's interesting the something else that kind of occurred to me was that sometimes we do things with the very best of intentions and it backfires. And so he got a lot of backlash for going over to Africa and working with African musicians, but it actually helped them. And it, lifted them up and gave them opportunities that just weren't there. So by refusing to participate with them, the other musicians and artists were actually harming the musicians over there uh, because it kept them from being able to do cool stuff that they didn't have the resources to do. And it also talked about how um, he is the child of immigrants and they came over from I can't remember if they came over from Poland or I can't remember where they came over from but um, they escaped they escaped the whole um, Holocaust situation over there but basically a lot of people he he was in Queens and a lot of the people didn't exactly have 
an identity. It was actually like a melting pot. So the whole idea of, of coming up in Queens when he did meant that he, they, they just naturally at that time borrowed from all the other different cultures and races. And it's what made so much of his music so um, dimensional, you know, not one sided, not one, not one thing, which got me thinking about something else. And this is something that really bothers me about social media. I think right now is one of the best times in all of history to be a visual artist. No other time have you been able to get your work out in front of so many people without gatekeepers. You know, you used to have to go, you know, jump through all kinds of hoops to get this gallery to show your work or, you know, you just, there was a game that you had to play. And of course you had to be extremely talented. And nowadays art, I, I think being talented and driven and producing good art is important. But I think it's also that just the very activity of being creative is important. And no other time in history have we been able to do that. And that being said, um, as a visual artist who likes to dabble in a variety of mediums, and I like to do drawing, I like to do pen and ink, I like to do watercolor, um, I would like to do acrylic, but my studio isn't really set up for um, big, uh, <laughs> I can't even think of what they're called. Canvases. Oh my gosh. Um, senior blonde moment here. Um, YouTube doesn't really reward you for that. And neither, neither do the galleries. They like you to produce consistent, same kind of art. And some of my favorite artists have been branching out into other things too. And I love, love, love to see that because I want to do that too. I don't want to be stuck only drawing or only painting um, or only, only sculpting, except I don't sculpt. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Why can't you do a lot of different things? One thing informs the other thing. And just like holding something textural helps your helps you produce better visual um, art. Doing one kind of art can actually benefit the other kind of art you do. And I don't know. I just I don't like being stuck in one kind of thing that I have to do. And I probably will never have a huge YouTube channel just because. I don't want to only draw. I don't only want to paint. And, you know, I might want to do something else too. You know, I might want to do collage or, you know, <laughs> make things for my house that are decorative out of some of the reject art that I've done. And I, I don't think that the YouTube algorithms are going to reward me for that. But at the same time, I also, boy, I really am rambling from one thing to another, but that's just the nature of these kind of drawings. And I think most of you who enjoy these also enjoy this aspect of the narrative. So I'm not going to go back and try to polish it all up. Um, but I just recently got monetized and I'm like a little kid because every day the, the number of the, the money that I have earned goes up just a little bit. And when I say just a little bit and that I'm being like a little kid, I mean it literally. I have made $4.92 so far. And every day I get so excited when I see oh, I got another 38 cents. And so yay me. <laughs> or I should really say yay you guys for watching my videos and um, getting me enough view hours finally to get monetized again. I got monetized last year and I was still finishing up my sister's estate and honestly, I was pretty burned out. And 
not artistically burned out, but just burned out on anything that required um, math <laughs> or uh, planning and that kind of stuff. I just wanted to do the art. I didn't really want to worry about the monetization at the time. And um, I thought that it would just stay that way. I would, I obviously didn't know very much about it. And I lost my opportunity to be monetized. So you guys have helped me regain that opportunity. And I want to thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Even though I'm not getting rich, it's still, it's still, a, I get a little thrill every time I get a little bit more money. <laughs> And of course, I'm not going to get paid until I've earned $100. And at this rate, it could be like three months. But it's still fun, you guys. It's still really fun. And I'm kind of excited about it. <laughs> so I've got a few other fun and exciting things coming up. Next weekend is my 34th anniversary with my husband. We've been together. It will be... I I think 35 and a half years even though we've been married 34 and we're gonna go stay at a hotel a, a nice fancy hotel for the weekend and get room service and have coffee out on the balcony um, overlooking the plaza and I can't wait I'm so excited we haven't done anything like this in so long but I got to tell you, uh, I'm also a little, I'm also, I have a little trepidation because every time we go someplace and do something like this, just the two of us, usually it doesn't go very well. One time I booked a bread and, a bed and breakfast down in um, Arkansas, Eureka, Arkansas, and it was the cutest little room and um, we hadn't been married that long, so um, it was supposed to be a really romantic night, a, a romantic weekend, and um, we were really enjoying our room, and it was a holiday weekend. I also have a problem with holiday weekends. I don't do well on those either. But um, so the people who owned the bed and breakfast weren't in town. They were someplace else. And around sundown we started noticing wasps coming into the room and as it got darker and darker there were swarms of wasps in our room in our bedroom so we got under the covers we turned the window unit air conditioner on as cold as it could go because we knew that would make them not be very active but you know how Indiana Jones hates snakes? I hate wasps. When I was a little kid, I was playing on someone else's swing set and there was a wasp nest on it and I got stung by a whole bunch of wasps. It was very traumatic and it took years before I could be outside and even hear a fly buzz by me um, without just being completely <laughs> completely re-traumatized and re-triggered over oh I hated it and so this this was not it <laughs> and I also almost got sick on the way down there because the roads wind around they're really winding roads and so it was it was a less than um it was not ideal can I say that it was not ideal we spent the next night in a something that was kind of like a motel six and very basic but it didn't have any wasps in it so i was happy anyway wish me luck that we won't have any wasps in our hotel room and we'll have a nice night a nice two nights okay and there's one more thing i want to talk about and that is the october art challenges and i put a poll up on my community tab so you can weigh in there or you can weigh in in the comments but Gosh, I just feel like August flew by. July went pretty fast. August just flew. And it's already the 9th or the 8th, the 8th of September. Already the first week of September is gone. And the other day I noticed on social media someone posting about 
Inktober. And I thought, oh my gosh, we just, it's still summer. <laughs> we still have barely gotten out of August. And now it's time to start thinking about um, the October art challenges. And, you know, there was all that hullabaloo about Inktober a few years ago. And it kind of soured Inktober for me, but at the same time, it's the one most people participate in. So if you want to feel like you're more included in a community, that's maybe the one to do. Um, last year I did Squaretober. Some of you guys were with me for that. And I know I'm going to do an art challenge. I just haven't decided exactly what I'm going to do, if I'm going to post every day or once a week. Um, I know I'm going to approach it not in a way like, oh, I've got this epic, cool drawing for Inktober. Um, not like a competition to see, you know, how, measure against other artists. But I'm going to use it definitely as a way to work on some things that I want to work on. Like one of the things I really want to work on is um, working in a, I want to, I want to start a sketchbook of motifs that I can draw on for inspiration. When I was in school, we had to do our own reference notebooks. Um, we, we had to do all the art periods and or not all of them, but we had so many we had to do. There were some specific and some we could choose and we had to draw, we had to go to museums, we had to go places and actually um, observe different elements of different art movements and art periods. And I did take it pretty seriously, but because I was, I was a very serious student at the time, but I didn't have any experience doing something like that. But now I do, and I kind of think that's how I want to approach the art challenge, is to maybe take a sketchbook and um, just figure out, and I'm, I'm not sure how to organize it. Let me know if you have any ideas. I would, I'm all ears. So... And I would love to know if you guys are going to participate in any of the art challenges. On the poll so far, I think I've had 10 votes and roughly half said they are participating and they do want to see videos about art challenges. The other roughly half said uh, they're not participating, but they still want to see videos. I think I have to go back and check. And then there, there was one lone person, and I totally get it. They're like, oh no, not this again this year. <laughs> if It's kind of like Christmas. If you don't celebrate Christmas, what, geez, really, again? Um, yeah, I get it. I totally get it, but I'm, I'm going to do it. And it seems like most of the people who watch this channel do want to see videos about it. So I don't, I don't know if it will be, I, I think probably what I'm going to do is not do an edited thing, but do like a real time in my sketchbook working on the videos. But of course, um, you know, working on the motifs or textures or whatever it is, um, drawings of bas reliefs. But I'll have drawn it first in pencil and then I'll go over it in ink. So if that sounds like something you guys would like to see, like real time drawing, no edits, just me talking um, in the camera, I think that's the way I want to do it this year. So let me know if that's interesting to you at all. Recently, I had someone contact me on Instagram asking what kind of pens I use specifically they were asking about fountain pens and the fountain pen that I did the first part of the drawing with is um, a Novelur it's the Peter pen and you can get it on gold spot pens I'll put that in the description 
when I did the contouring of the little, I like, I think they're, I kind of like to call them beans. They kind of look like beans. Uh, the contouring that I did, I used a Pentel brush pen and then I used a variety of Micron pens and um, any kind of fine liner will, will do well. Um, and then I also, for the really fine detail, like on these pearls, I used the Pilot SeaTac and they I had to get them on Amazon. They come in a variety of uh, line thicknesses. The smallest is a 0.02 it's a 0.25 millimeter. It's really, really, really fine. Um, all of the pens that I used are waterproof except for the Pilot C1 pens. Um, they are not. But since I'm not going to watercolor over this or acrylic over it or do anything like that or do any kind of wash over it, it's fine. They're really wonderful pens for uh, getting really fine detail. They're beautiful pens and they're, they're, for what you're getting, they're not very expensive. Um, so I'll put a link to those in the description as well. The paper I'm using is, um, oh, I know what it is. I had a sketchbook that I made with Fabriano Artistico um, hot press paper and I didn't like the sketchbook. It was too small. So I cut all the pages. I didn't want to waste the paper. So I cut all the pages out and decided to use them here on the channel for smaller drawings. And also for a, a six by six artist um, fundraiser for a local group. So that's what I'm using for paper. Um, I use, oh, I also used a little jelly roll for the white. There were some sections that I had on here that I hated the way they looked. So I just went over them in black and then took a jelly roll pen and went over them with white jelly roll. So you can do that if you make a horrible mistake on, <laughs> or something you just really don't like, you can do that. Um, that's about it, I think. Oh, I... I um, um, taped this to a gator board uh, just because that's what I had handy. I always like to tape my paper to something if it's not on a block. And so that's a gator board that I normally stretch my watercolor paper on, but it works really well for this too. Okay, and we're just about done with this video. And so I feel compelled because I haven't done it in a while to say, hey, if you liked this video, would you give it a like and maybe subscribe if you'd like to see more content like this and maybe share it with someone you think would like? I mean, you don't have to do all that, but throw me a bone and give me a thumbs up, okay? Would you? <laughs> if you've been here, all the way to the end, you probably won't mind doing that. Anyway, you guys take care and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. Smooches. Bye. -bye. Bye.